two more issues are going to occur in the 1850s leading up to the Civil War. Um, perhaps three, if we include the election of Abraham Lincoln. The first is going to be the notorious Dred Scott case. Dred Scott was a slave owned by an army surgeon from Missouri by the name of John Emerson. In the 1830s, Emerson took Scott with him to postings in Illinois, in the northern part of the Louisiana Purchase Territory, Minnesota, free territories. Dredd worked for him as a personal servant and labored on land which Emerson invested in. In Minnesota, again, free territory, Dredd married another slave, Harriet, who also came to be owned by Emerson. On the way back with Emerson to return back to his home in St. Louis, Missouri in 1838, Harriet gives birth to a daughter prior to entering Missouri territory in, in free territory. On December 29th, 1843, Dr. Emerson dies, and he leaves behind all his property to his wife, Irene Emerson, including his slaves. Mrs. Emerson now loans Dred and Harriet out to her brother-in-law, an army officer in Texas, and he keeps them for several years until he returns them back to St. Louis, Missouri in February of 1846. On April 6, 1846, Dred and Harriet Scott now file suddenly a petition in Missouri Circuit Court asking leave to sue Irene Emerson. Now, the way these lawsuits work in Missouri was complicated. Um, a slave had to sue his owner for some kind of breach of conduct um, that would be permissible between an owner and a slave, but not between a free plaintiff and a defendant. The court then as part of this procedure, whether to allow that individual to sue or not, would have to evaluate whether the plaintiff was a free person or a slave, and then allow or disallow the actual lawsuit to go forward. Often the lawsuit itself was merely a token uh, lawsuit. The law, it wasn't about the lawsuit, it was about getting permission to be able to sue someone if you're an African American. And if you get permission, that means you are a free person because slaves cannot sue their masters. The um, Dred Scott lawsuit essentially alleges that on April 4th, Irene Emerson, quote, beat, bruised Dred and imprisoned him for 12 hours end of quote, and they claim $10 damages. So again, it's not about the lawsuit itself. It's about getting into court and trying to get the judge to say, yeah, you can go ahead and sue them because you're a free person. So prior to going ahead with this suit, the court now would have to decide whether Dred Scott is actually a free person and therefore could sue um, Mrs. Emerson for assault and false imprisonment and, and, and demand a compensation of $10. That's the point of the suit. Now, McPherson in his uh, textbook claims that the Scots were encouraged by friends to launch th the suit, but there really is no evidence for that. It, it remains a mystery. Um, it's 
possible that um, dread kind of in the slave world, um, talking with other slaves might have heard about uh, this way of perhaps g gaining your freedom, especially if you had a claim on freedom, certainly Dred Scott being taken into the free territory um, now has a claim that he was set free once he was taken out into Minnesota territory. And he has a good chance as well because Missouri courts in the past had consistently ruled in favor of freedom for those slaves who were taken to free territory and then brought back to Missouri. According to Don Fehrenbacher, who's probably the authority on the Dred Scott case and the, the legal history of slavery in the USA, it's very likely that the Scots launched their suit on their own initiatives. Um, many pre slaves previously had had done that, and it was a procedure that's well known among the slave population in Missouri. Now, here's some problems. First of all, in the case of the Scots, their owner Emerson did not exactly take up evidence. Uh, sorry, um, their owner Emerson did not exactly take up residence. Um, he was in free territory by virtue of being posted there as a military surgeon. Um, he's there on federal service and uh, federal government service and military service is different than, quote, taking up residence. But even that issue had already been dealt with by the Missouri High Court in a case called Rachel versus Walker, where the court ruled that while the owner was required by the federal government to reside in free territory for the purposes of military service, the owner, quote, was not compelled by the government to keep the plaintiff there as his slave, end of quote. So it's looking like a slum, slam dunk case for the Scots. Uh, nobody thought there would be any problem for them to have their status as free persons to be recognized. It took about a year and a half before the case actually got on the court docket, June 30th of 1847. Irene Emerson was now determined to block the Scots' bid for freedom by any means, including technicalities. The court would need to prove two things. One, that the Scots were taken to free territory. And two, that Irene Emerson, since she would be a defendant in any lawsuit that Dred Scott was asking leave to um, launch against her, the, they would need to prove that um, Irene Emerson is actually claiming to be Scott's owner. Now, witnesses testified to the, um, the Scots being taken into free territory. That's no problem. However, when it came to proving that Emerson claimed ownership of Scott, um, Emerson's uh, lawyer was a, a little bit more clever than whatever representation Scott's had. Um, the court essentially called in the male house um, owners, uh, you know, the male house holders, where uh, the Scots had been rented from Mrs. Emerson. And the husbands all kind of when asked, well, you know, did the Scots work there? The husbands, the male householders, all kind of shrugged their shoulders and said, well, you know, my wife takes care of that, right? If, um, you know, the Scots were rented as slaves to do household work, that's something um, my wife would know about. I don't know anything about it. 
Um, and, and so not having called the females of the house, the wives, um, on this technicality, the court rejects Scott's claim for the right to sue Emerson. It's, it's a very clever ploy, and of course, it takes advantage of the Scots' weak presentation of their case in, in, in the court. The Scots' attorney now moves for a new trial, and is granted. And so Emerson now fires, uh, files a bill of exception to the new trial, claiming that Emerson had nothing to do with Scott's in, in, in enslavement, while at the same time, Emerson continues to rent the Scots out to others. And so it's January now of 1850 when the case comes to trial again. And this time, the Scots lawyers make sure that there are witnesses that clearly state that this was, you know, Mrs. Emerson who was renting out the Scots and obviously was claiming to be their, their owner. The defense in the meantime, once again, attempts to argue that, you know, Dr. Emerson during his military postings had been under military jurisdiction and not subject to the laws of the civil government prohibiting slavery in free territory in Minnesota. The argument is overruled, again, on the basis of Rachel versus Walker, an 1836 case that I had just described. And so the court now rules in Dred Scott's favor, um, making him and um, his wife nominally free. Mrs. Emerson now appeals to the Missouri Supreme Court. And of course, now um, we're looking at a very different political climate than we had the one way back in 1846 when Dred Scott first filed his case. Um, between January of 1850 and March of 1852, when the Missouri Supreme Court will return a verdict, of course, we have everything that is beginning to unfold next door to Missouri, the entire discussion about whether the Kansas-Nebraska Act is going to be passed and what that would mean, and as well, the politics of the Compromise of 1850 that divided both politicians and officials in the state of Missouri between pro-slavery and pro-free fac factions. Missouri was on the brink of being surrounded on three sides by free territories. And we already, as I say, saw how the 1854 Missouri border ruffians would flood into neighboring uh, Kansas to stack the vote for the slave constitution there. And so the Supreme Court of um, Missouri now um, is going to get pulled and sucked into these issues. The Supreme Court rules in the favor now of Mrs. Emerson returning Dred Scott to slavery. And so the only court left for the Dred Scots now to appeal that decision would be the Supreme Court of the United States. In March of 1851, um, the United States Supreme Court was under the leadership of Chief Justice Roger Taney. Um, Taney had already made a ruling in another case that would have impact on the Dred Scott case in the way the U.S. Supreme Court is going to interpret it. Um, in a case called Strader versus Graham, um, the case 
I'll describe it to you, um, Kentucky slave musicians who had been briefly taken into Ohio were helped to escape into Canada by several men in Ohio. Their Kentucky owners sue the men for damages. The defense argued that the slaves had been freed under the provisions of the Northwest Ordinance by virtue of having stepped into the territory of Ohio. The Kentucky Supreme Court hold, holds against the Ohio defendants, ruling that whatever status the slaves might have had in Ohio changed nothing in Kentucky, and it makes the men from Ohio who aided their escape liable for damages in Kentucky to the slave owners. The defendants now appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. And a Supreme Court can make one of three decisions. It, it can overturn a lower court decision. It can um, affirm the lower court decision. Or the third option is that it can refuse to hear the case. You know, this is not something we think that the Supreme Court needs to get involved with. And that was um, Chief Justice Taney's decision uh, that they will not hear this case. But he gives an opinion as to why they don't want to hear this case. And what he comes forth with is something called the doctrine of reattachment or reversion, the doctrine of reversion. The idea that um, slave law remains attached to a slave, even if that slave is taken from slave territory to free territory. And that any slave, if indeed freed when taken into free territory, reverts back to slavery when that slave is brought back to uh, slave territory. And so um, the Kentucky Supreme Court decision is remains standing. Those men in Ohio can be sued, even though they helped slaves escape from free territory. And so on March 22nd, 1852, the Missouri Supreme Court now returns a decision um, overturning the verdict in Dred Scott's case and ruling that he is to be returned in slavery. The verdict, the Missouri court explains, quote, we are almost persuaded that the introduction of slavery amongst us was in the providence of God, who makes the evil passions of men subservient to his glory and a means of placing that unhappy race within the pale of civilized nations. In other words, um, slavery, according to the Missouri court, is God's gift to African Americans. It's going to now drag out until 1856 for Dred Scott's lawyers to be heard by the United States Supreme Court. And it won't be until 1857 that they will issue their ruling. By then, um, the alleged owner of the Scots uh, was Irene Emerson's brother, John Sanford. And so right to the end, it was never clear who exactly was the actual owner. It took the Scots 11 years from when they first initiated their um, appeal. The decision of the Supreme Court was now upheld by the United States Supreme Court, that the Scots have no claim to freedom. And it's a highly political decision. Um, in violation of that doctrine I had described to you of judicial restraint, the notion that a Supreme Court should render strictly non-political decisions and inter interpretations of the law as it is, rather than um, overturning laws unless they're unconstitutional or making new laws. 
1857 as well, when this decision is going to be made, seven of the nine justices were Democratic Party appointees, and five of them had come from uh, slave states. Chief Justice Roger Taney, who would write the Dred Scott decision in 1857, um, is going to go in many ways beyond the issues that the Supreme Court needed to address in this case. In other words, um, it exceeded the doctrine of judicial restraint. The Dred Scott decision affirming the Missouri Supreme Court ruling that the Scots are to remain slaves ran 55 printed pages of um, which an extraordinary 24 pages were dedicated to a question that was not at issue, whether or not African Americans were citizens of the United States. Even today, historians still debate by what process or for what motives Justice Taney is going to go there. Taney introduced the argument as follows, quote, the question is simply this, can a Negro whose ancestors were imported into this country and sold as slaves become a member of the political community formed and brought into existence by the Constitution of the United States, and as such become entitled to all the rights and privileges and immunities guaranteed by that instrument to the citizens, of which rights is the privilege of suing in the court of the United States in the cases specified by the Constitution, end of quote. Taney is going to argue that to be a citizen of the United States was the same thing as being one of the, quote, sovereign people of the United States, and that at the time of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, he argued that Blacks had not been regarded as, quote, constituent members of this sovereignty. On the contrary, he writes, they were at that time considered as a subordinate and inferior class of beings who had been subjugated by the dominant race, and whether emancipated or not, yet remained subject to their authority and had no rights or privileges, but such as those who held the power and the government might choose to grant them. End of quote. And I, I think the salient term in that paragraph I just read to you is, again, quote, whether emancipated or not. In other words, according to Taney, all African Americans stood on the same ground, free or enslaved, fixed forever by the fact that their ancestors had once been enslaved, they, according to Taney, do not have the same rights that um, founding American citizens had, i.e. the white people. He goes on, quote, they had for more than a century before been regarded as beings of an inferior order and all together unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect, and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his own benefit. End of quote. Now, it should be noted that Taney does not state that in 1857, when he was making that ruling blacks, quote, had no rights, which the white man was bound to respect. He's saying at the time when the Constitution of the United States was being drawn up um, at Philadelphia, that that was their, their status. But of course, 
the anti-slave forces and the Republican press are going to seize on that phrase. And, and it remains one that often you find in history books today discussing the, the Dred Scott decision. Tanny makes just some blatant errors in his opinion, errors of law. He claims, for example, that state citizenship did not automatically confer U.S. citizenship, ignoring completely the provisions of the U.S. Constitution that states the opposite. Once a citizen of one state, once citizenship was recognized by all the states in the United States. Taney argues that Blacks were not state citizens before 1789, the year of the Constitutional Conference, that the Constitution therefore did not extend to Blacks since it did not recognize them as either state citizens or as U.S. citizens. No state, Taney says, has the power to make Black citizens within the meaning of the Constitution. Taney insists that the Constitution excluded all Blacks, free or enslaved, from all the rights and protections guaranteed within it. He writes, quote, the only two provisions which point to them and include them, treat them as property and make it the duty of the government to protect it. No other power in relation to this race is to be found in the Constitution. And as it is a government of special delegated powers, no authority beyond these two provisions can be constitutionally exercised. The government of the United States has no right to interfere for any purpose but that of protecting the rights of the owner, leaving it all together with the several states to deal with this race, whether emancipation or not, as each state may think justice, humanity, and the interests and safety of society require. The states evidently intended to reserve this power exclusively to themselves." End of quote. So he's making references to those constitutional provisions that I had introduced you to in, in, in the earlier um, lecture, where, again, we, we have these references to slaves without the use of the word slave for various purposes, including the imposition of uh, tariffs on the importation of slaves, as well as the um, rendition, extradition clause that required free states to return escaped slaves back to slave states from which they had originated. Taney argues, therefore, or actually rules, um, that the Missouri Compromise of 1820 outlawing slavery north of the 36 degree 30 minute line was unconstitutional, although by now it's, it's a dead issue because, of course, the um, Kansas-Nebraska Act had explicitly repealed the Missouri Compromise. So uh, the effect of the Dred Scott decision, of course, it polarizes the free states from the slave states into a place where only war can now resolve their differences. Um, there's no justice. And, 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 and if you cannot get justice in um, the Supreme Court of the land, obviously the only thing left to do now is to pick up a gun, which is exactly what's going to occur. It also um, just illustrates how fragile um, a line a Supreme Court can draw between um, political parties because of the appointment system and the lifelong service that a judge um, does. As, as, as you saw, you know, this is, of course, what's facing 
currently the United States, as by the time you're listening to this lecture, it's entirely possible that Trump's second nominee to the Supreme Court is going to be appointed. Um, nudging now the Supreme Court into a conservative ideology. Um, and of course, justices today, one of the things that um, not only Trump, but certainly um, other presidents have begun doing is they've begun appointing younger justices. So they, they, they once appointed, they may remain there for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and of course, with the miracles of modern medicine, some of those justices are, are you know, almost like mummies, but they're still there, still making their decisions um, and, and were chosen by various pres presidents and, and confirmed by various senates for essentially their political beliefs and, and, and their doctrines. And, and of course, the big, the big issue facing the Supreme Court is whether, of course, Obamacare is constitutional and um, the issue of um, Roe versus Wade, um, a, a women's right to abortion, can be perhaps over, over, overturned that decision uh, with, 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 a, uh, with a more conservative court. And, and that's where things are headed right now. And FDR, Roosevelt, fa faced a similar issue when his economic recovery plan um, during the depression was overturned by a Supreme Court. And um, what Roosevelt did essentially was he threatened to expand the court. This is something that could be done. And once that threat was made, the Supreme Court began to back off. The other thing, of course, is a president can entirely ignore a Supreme Court decision. Presidents have done that. Um, you know, there's a political risk to that. Uh, you could end up losing an election if the American people think that, um, you know, ignoring a Supreme Court decision was, was somehow um, untenable. But, you know, Roosevelt, as I say, was a popular president. He could do it. Lincoln, in fact, um, is going to even go further. Um, Lincoln will ignore Justice Taney's um, rulings on the issue of suspension of habeas corpus. And Lincoln himself will actually consider arresting Justice Taney during the Civil War. But his, um, his cabinet kind of talks him out of it. The other thing, of course, the Dred Scott decision does is um, it further polarizes the political discourse in the United States. Um, the northern states can now point to the tyranny of the southern slave states in their control of politicians, the Democratic Party, and the judicial process um, in the Union. Southern states could likewise pour, point to the tyranny of northern free states by claiming that continued anti-slavery provisions were in violation of the U.S. Constitution and that the United States Supreme Court itself had said so, but the Northerners are just doing whatever they want anyway. And, and, and so who are the rebels? The North or the South? It's once again very reminiscent of the issues of 1850. And in fact, this is happening in the 1850s. It's not even reminiscent of those issues. It's, it's, it goes hand in hand with those issues. And so the argument now is, is going to become more shrill that justice could only be found through secession of the South for for Southerners or armed enforcement of the North, notwithstanding, you know, what the Supreme Court had had ruled. Clearly, a formula for 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 disaster. So, the Dred Scott decision is, as I say, this this um, powerful decision. It it worsens situations, and and of course, you already saw those trends I showed you in a previous. Um, 
in the previous lecture is just about a kind of northern hostility to African Americans voting and all the voting restrictions that are being imposed, you know, more and more as we get closer to the Civil War era. And, and, and so clearly, this is going to be a disaster. And, uh, you know, it now essentially questions whether um, African Americans are even citizens of the United States, even though for generations since the abolition of the slave trade um, in, in the international sphere, um, uh, you know, at least two to three generations of um, African American slaves were natural born Americans. Another issue that as well is going to very late in this process polarize Americans is um, John Brown. John Brown, who had hacked with broadswords five pro-slavery settlers to death back in 1856. Um, now he'll strike again. October 16th, 1859, John Brown will launch a raid on Harper's Ferry, Virginia, where he will attempt to seize a federal arsenal take um, all the rifles from the federal arsenal and distribute them among slaves in an attempt to raise a slave revolt in Virginia. There's John Brown. This is what a Harper's Ferry looked like before the war and, and here running next to the train is the Springfield Arsenal where um, the U.S. Army's rifles were being made. This is what it would look like during the war. You can see it's already burned out. And so you have um, Virginia on uh, this side of the river. And if I'm not mistaken, it's Maryland on the northern side of this river. This is what it looks like today. It's, it's, it's kind of like Niagara on the lake, you know, one of those um, 19th century towns with, you know, $25 hot dogs and tourist traps. It's, it's uh, meant to kind of freeze Harper's Ferry in its um, Civil War era state. And the modern town actually is kind of on the other side of that hill. And you're encouraged to leave your car in a huge parking lot there and just take a bus into this old part of town that you see here. So this is the arsenal. Um, everything goes wrong for John, uh, for John Brown. Um, first, uh, he only succeeds in killing a freed African-American, um, a railway porter that he mistakes for um, the Virginia militia. Um, slaves do not rush out to join John Brown's rebellion, but um, federal troops and the Virginia militia do in fact, Robert E. Lee is in command and puts down this rebellion. The, uh, John, um, John Brown and, and um, some of his sons and his um, aiders and abettors retreat into the engine house right here. This is kind of where there was a steam engine driving with belts. Um, the the, the uh, mills that were working inside the factory. They're surrounded by the army and there's this shootout. Um, the sons are, are, are killed. John Brown himself is, is wounded and taken prisoner. John Brown will stand trial 
um, for treason, essentially. And he will be sentenced to death. As he's led off to be hung, um, people bring their children to him, abolitionists and African-Americans, slaves to uh, be blessed by John Brown. And John Brown's last words before he's um, executed are um, something like only rivers of blood will wash the sin away from this country. And in a way, he's going to be right about that part. Many in the North condemn John Brown's tactics. Um, it's many feel that he just has gone too far, but it, it begins to radicalize a faction of the abolitionist movement. Uh, some believe that what John Brown did was sublime and glorious. Um, and, and of course, that further alienates the South. Um, the South essentially is, is going to use the John Brown incident as a, again, a reason for secession that, you know, now northerners are not only you know disobeying the ruling of the supreme court and the, the u.s constitution but are actually attempting to ferment a slave revolt among um, our our people and the one probably greatest significance of the john brown revolt is that now southern militias begin training and, and, you know, militia service up until John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry was kind of a, um, you know, a social activity. People did it as um, a way of meeting other people. It was a way of advancing yourself in society as well. Um, some saw it as fun. And, 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 and now, of course, um, the Confederate states worried that there are going to be many John Browns coming down into the South attempting to ferment rebellion among the slaves. They start now training the militia in, in earnest to the point that when, you know, this is 1859, so, so two years later, civil war is going to break out. Um, the Confederacy, through its trained militia, is going to have a formidable force to unleash, while the United States government will have approximately 17,000 federal soldiers. Most of them will be deployed fighting um, aboriginals in, in, in the West. And, and so um, the United States is going to be very poorly um, prepared for, for the early months of the Civil War. The Confederacy will actually have over 100,000 troops. And in, in fact, in the first months of the war, Confederates are turning back volunteers because they have too many. While the Union... Um, is desperately trying to put together an army through the militias of Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, New York, and so forth. And those militias have not been training in the same earnest as um, the, the future Confederate states were, as the way the Southern states were. And, and so this is, is going to bode uh, not too well for the early months and in fact years of the civil war the union is once war breaks out the union is going to have a very very hard time and so um with the dred scott decision and uh, john brown in 1859 his raid on the harper's ferry um things now are are very very tense and volatile in the united states and uh, 
Of course, now only one last episode essentially is left in this drama before war breaks out. And that is going to be the 1860 presidential election, the last one before the Civil War. 